Hello, friend. Welcome to Grandpa's Horror Stories. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and comment your own stories. There are plenty more true scary stories that happened in real life that got media coverage or were turned into films. We've compiled a list of horrifying stories that will make you sigh at the thought of something so evil happening in real life, as well as unbelievable, horrifying accounts shared by people on Reddit. Do you remember a real-life horror story covered in the media that shook you to the core? What was the story? Share it in the comments. Story number one. Help me. A few years ago, my boss went on holiday for a couple of weeks to Spain. Midway through the holiday, he got a phone call from the police informing him that his sister had passed away in a fire in her flat. So he rushes back home early, deals with the police and the passing and everything. My employers told him to take some time off to grieve, which he duly did. When he came back to work on a Monday morning a few weeks later, we invited him into our coffee room to talk and offer him our sympathies and support. About half an hour later, he excuses himself to start work. He walks into his office, sits down at his desk, turns on his computer, and checks to see if there are any answer phone messages. And the very first message that plays is his sister, screaming down the phone, help me, help me. I'm trapped, I can't breathe. Still sends chills down my spine to think about it. As you can imagine, he was pretty traumatized. Story number two, the voice. My grandfather told me this story about how one time he was sitting in a chair in front of the house when he heard his wife repeatedly calling him from inside the house. The thing is, my grandmother passed away a few years before that, but he told me that the voice was so pressing that he actually got up to look inside the house and as soon as he got inside, he heard a loud crash behind him and turned around to see that the chair he has been sitting in moments ago had been crushed by the cast iron gutter that fell on it. If he didn't come inside the house, he would have probably been seriously injured. Every time I think about it, it sends chills down my spine. Story number three, Apocalypse is Coming. In September 2014, a Utah boy discovered his parents and three brothers deceased after arriving home. The Salt Lake Tribune reported finding a to-do list in the house, which included tasks like feed the pets and find someone to wash the house written on it. The found list gave the impression that the parents were preparing to go on vacation However, there was no suicide note, no warning that they would do this, and no explanation. After autopsies, it was revealed that the five family members consumed a lethal concoction of drugs that September day. However, why and how the parents and kids consumed the drugs remained a mystery. Sometime later, police reveal more terrifying information about the case. According to family members' statements, the parents' motivations included believing that the world's end was near and frequently spoke of leaving this world. Apparently scared of the apocalypse, the parents poisoned the kids and themselves. Story number four. Car at the red light, driving home, with a buddy from the high school summer job at the local amusement park. It's about three in the morning, and there is no traffic at all. Get stuck at the red light that never ends, and while we are waiting, another car pulls up next to us, a big black hearse in immaculate condition, with a clown in the driver's seat, with full makeup and costume on. He never moved, didn't look at us, 
nothing, just stared straight ahead the whole time. Story number five, I just need a haircut. I was in Ryan a dorm for two years in college. A girl who had been having stress issues finally snapped. She was found by someone in a dark stair while I was in an older dorm from 1887. So there were plenty of nooks and crannies. By the time she was found, she had already torn out over half of her hair and had eaten it. She just kept on saying, I just need a haircut and a perfectly normal voice. It took six of us and the police sedating her to finally get her strapped down to an ambulance gurney. To this day, I can't forget how powerful she was. She couldn't have weighed over 120 pounds, yet she had this sort of superhuman ability to rip her arms away, to tear out another clump of hair and stuff it into her mouth, all with a perfectly straight face. Story number six, Milwaukee Cannibal. Between 1978 and 1991, American serial killer and sex offender Jeffrey Lionel Dahmer, moniker as the Milwaukee Cannibal, slayed and dismembered 17 men and boys age 14 to 33. Dahmer dismembered and kept their organs and bones in his home and used them for carnal pleasure. Sources claim that Dahmer was fascinated with deceased animals from a young age. When he was for years old, Dahmer may have noticed his father removing animal corpses from the house's foundation. This may have sparked his mania with deceased animals. Dahmer referred to animal bones as his fiddlesticks and was oddly pleased by the sound the bones made. In 1991, after one of his potential victims escaped, Donner was captured and admitted to his crimes. Despite being diagnosed with borderline personality disorder, schizotypal personality disorder, and psychotic disorder, Dahmer was named to be legally sane at his trial. Three years later, a fellow inmate fatally beat him. On September 21, 2022, Netflix released a 10-part biographical crime drama series, Dahmer Monster, The Jeffrey Dahmer Story. Soon, Netflix's dramatization of Dahmer's murderous rampage in Milwaukee received a massive backlash from the public and people whose relatives were butchered by Dahmer. Story number seven, The Perfect Crime. On November 10th, 1923, Nathan Leopold committed the travel six hours from Chicago to the University of Michigan, accompanied by his friend and lover, Richard Loeb, they intended to break into Loeb's former fraternity, but all they had taken was a typewriter, a few watches, some knives, and around $80 in loose change. Leopold was agitated on the way back to Chicago because the robbery had been a big effort for a small payoff. When Leopold finally stopped complaining, Loeb began to discuss his idea of committing the perfect crime. While they continued to travel through the country roads toward Chicago, they broke into several homes and started a few fires, but none of their crimes had been published in the media. Loeb desired to commit a crime that would create a huge buzz, abduction and homicide of a child. After plotting their plan through the winter, in May they kidnapped a child they knew had a wealthy father who would pay the ransom. Following the abduction, they beat the boy's skull with a chisel, jammed a rag down his throat, and disposed of the body. When the two returned to the city, Leopold dropped the ransom letter into a post box. However, their plan to execute the perfect crime failed. 
The following day, a passerby spotted the child's lifeless body, and soon the police traced Leopold by finding the eyeglasses he dropped near the body. On May 31st, ten days after the homicide, both young men came clean and revealed to the state's attorney how they had slayed Bobby Franks. Nathan Leopold confessed that they had killed Bobby only for the thrill of it. At the time of the murder, Richard Loeb and Nathan Leopold were 18 and 19 years old. They were sentenced to 99 years in prison. Story number eight, Markesh Arch Killer. The late 1800s saw the homicides of at least 36 women by Moroccan shoemaker and trader Hajj Mohammed Masfui. Monikered as the Marrakesh arch killer, he hosted dinner parties for affluent women at his home where he would drug them and then decapitate them with a dagger while they were asleep. He robbed them of their possessions and money and buried them. Authorities in Morocco recovered the remains of 20 mutilated people in a deep trench beneath his store, and another 16 were located in the garden outside. Masfui admitted that he slayed for money, often very modest sums. In 1906, Masfui was eventually arrested and executed. Masfui was initially ordered to be crucified However, the sentence was then altered to beheading in response to public outrage. Ultimately, it was decided that he should suffer. Every day for four weeks, he was carried from his cell on to the market square and whipped ten times with a rod made of prickly acacia. On June 11, 1906, Masfui was to be walled up alive in the Marrakesh Marketplace Bazaar. Masfui went silent on the third day, and many people in the crowd expressed their rage that he perished too quickly. Story number nine, Texarkana's Phantom Killer. In 1946, in Texarkana, for horrifying crimes occurred in less than three months on the Texas side of the town. Three violent incidents targeted young people parked in lovers' lanes. The fourth, on the Arkansas side, was the shooting of an elderly couple in their remote farmstead. After the shooting spree, five individuals were lethally shot and three suffered critical injuries. The cops received very little information from the distraught survivors. The homicides shook the community to its grounds. While husbands were away on business trips, women packed up their belongings, took their kids, and checked into the hotel. Others devised security systems in the style of Rube Goldberg by connecting pots and pans to wire laid throughout their property. Normally an arm Citizens placed pallets on the floor so their kids could lie next to them as they slept with loaded pistols. Texarkana Gazette dubbed the assailant the Phantom Killer. Several books about the case have been written, and a highly fictionalized film called The Town. That dreaded sundown was made in 1976. In 2014, a remake of the original movie was released. The Texas Department of Public Safety once referred to Texarkana's serial killings as the number one unsolved murder case in Texas history. Story number 10, Cell Phone Stalker. In 2007, ABC News reported on a series of ominously precise grave threats made to different families via cell phones. The families claim that the calls, which threaten to slay their children, pets, and grandparents, came in any time at night. According to one family, the callers seemed to know when the kids left for school and when they were home alone. Families also received voicemails with recordings 
their private conversations. According to the victims, the caller was aware of their activities and what they were wearing. The family of Courtney Kaikandal, 16, said that her cell phone started sending text messages to her friends by itself in February, which is when the family's problems began. The Kaikandal family also reported a caller having a scratchy voice and threatening to slice their throats which continued for months. Another victim reported receiving a call from an unknown caller saying they preferred lemons when the woman was slicing limes in her kitchen. The police couldn't find the perpetrators. 